I'm Nancy Howell, and I'm one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon, and I have the pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. George Archibald from the International Crane Foundation, located in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Archibald is here at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and he's doing a presentation this evening entitled Cranes, Ambassadors of Biodiversity and Goodwill. I, I love that title. It's, it's, it's very uh, appropriate because I've looked at the website from the International Crane Foundation, and things are taking place all over the world. So I do have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask of Dr. Archibald, but would you like to just mention a few things about yourself first? Well, I've been working on cranes for 50 years. Um, I started out in northern Canada, I'm a Canadian, with sandhill cranes that I was fascinated by. And I continued my interest to Cornell University where I did my doctorate on the evolutionary relationships of cranes. Oh, wow and became very aware of their status worldwide. So together with a colleague from Cornell, Ronald Sowey, we started a new nonprofit organization, the International Crane Foundation. The venue was his father's farm in Wisconsin that he leased for one dollar a year. And we built up the foundation breeding the very rare cranes from Asia initially and then later on moving into a lot of work with the whooping cranes in North America. We moved from the Sawi farm in 1983 to our permanent campus near Baraboo, Wisconsin and I continue uh, to work full-time for this organization. Probably one of the main things you do is do uh, lectures around different places, different venues, is that right? I do a lot of presentations, mm -hmm. uh, maybe 10 or 12 a year in, oh, okay. in different cities okay, in the fantastic. U.S. It's been a while since you've been here in Cleveland at mm -hmm. the Natural History Museum, um, and I t will tell you, it's been a little while since I've been up to the International Crane Foundation, but I have visited mm -hmm. there, and it's fabulous. Well, the area is beautiful. Yeah. It's gorgeous countryside. Um, so. How many crane species are there in the world? There are 15 species of cranes, and 11 of them are endangered. Ah, okay. In America, we have only two species, the most abundant, the sandhill crane, and the rarest, the whooping crane. Okay, wow, so the whooping crane is the rarest of all crane species? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, I think a lot of us have had our nice experiences with sandhill cranes. Uh, we had a speaker with our Audubon group earlier this year, uh, and um, he did speak on, on sandhills in Ohio, and they're becoming much more abundant. Right. And I don't know <laughs> if it's habitat changes or agricultural changes, but, but it's, it's nice to see them around because they are really impressive. Uh, actually, it's an expansion of a remnant population that survived in the 1930s in central Michigan and mm -hmm. central mm -hmm. Wisconsin wow. and has subsequently increased and is moving out and they're even breeding in New Brunswick now. Oh, wow. Amazing. <clears throat> what appears to be the biggest threat to cranes, not only in North America, but in other parts of the world as far as their, their populations? What, what's some of the big problems that they're facing? Uh, there are two major areas of threats. One is killing of cranes, which happens by poisoning, sometimes accidentally in Africa, sometimes intentionally in China. Um, it's shooting of cranes, which is a major problem with our whooping cranes. And in the Middle East, a lot of cranes are, are shot. <coughs> Middle East area. The other uh, major problem is the conservation of wetlands and grasslands that are critical for the breeding of cranes. Okay. Uh, do you think climate change is having any effect on uh, some of these concerns? Yes. Um, our whooping cranes winter on the coast of Texas and if the sea level rise as predicted happens their their habitat will be destroyed mm -hmm. it will be too deep for them so we have to work on the conservation of upland areas which eventually may be wetland areas and <clears throat> in asia and in north america cranes are starting to winter much further north 
Mm, okay. Cranes that used to go to Spain are now wintering in northern France. Cranes that used to go to India are now wintering in, in uh, Turkmenistan. Okay. And so on. <clears throat> so we're seeing definite changes, definite changes in, in, in the cranes. Where the populations right. are and, yeah. and then other things like, like the sea level rise. Wow. Uh, yeah, so it's things that we're, we have to all work together as a global right. community. Yeah. Right. Um, sometimes our organizations, it could be the museum, it could be Western Cuyahoga Audubon, are asked to, you know, why, why preserve certain species, like cranes or, or a certain type of grass or a certain insect? Why might it be important to, to preserve cranes or anything? Well, we're all part of an enormous web of interconnectedness and simplification of that complex network um, can reduce its effectiveness in ways that we don't even understand. So from a survival point of view, it's, it's best to keep all parts of the machine intact, even although we don't understand what all the connections are all the time. And from a very selfish point of view, we want to have an environment that's rich for ourselves to enjoy with beautiful flowers and habitats and birds like cranes. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. So so valuing what we have out there, even though we don't know if it's, it's valuable as far as maybe providing uh, medicines or things, just valuing the, the species in themselves. How do we get that point across to um, the public, uh, some like like I educate here at the museum. I like well, to I think to penicillin is a, is a good example. It's mold, basically uh -huh. created by mold, which is considered a pretty disgusting thing. <laughs> but it produces penicillin, mm -hmm. and that's how they discovered penicillin. So who knows what secrets lie hidden in different species? Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's in our prerogative to do in any of them. Right, I think right. we should have to keep them all. So there's and that what bio, secrets right. rest there. I think the penicillin is a great yeah. example. So there's that biodiversity, you know, keep right. that biodiversity, because right. we just don't know what all the parts are. Right. And like you say, we want to keep that machine going. Right. Fantastic. Um, again, I noticed from the International Crane Foundation website that you have people working all over the world. Let's see, uh, some of the countries, Rwanda, China, Vietnam, South Africa, Russia. Wow, how do you keep track of everybody and, and what are some of the, the uh, main jobs that, that are being done in those countries? Um, in Asia, most of our work is concentrated on habitat conservation. The crane is a sacred bird in many Asian countries. Mm -hmm. Although I mentioned previously that poisoning of cranes is a problem in some areas of China, overall the Chinese culture is very supportive of cranes, mm -hmm. so this is sort of an act of vandalism. Oh. So, um, but mainly we're working on habitat conservation in our field work and education. Often, even although people are very poor and, and have many human needs, mm -hmm. If they realize that this is the only place where these beautiful birds are found, they see them through new eyes, and they have a sense of responsibility for them. In some of the poorest areas of Africa, we've been able to conduct little campaigns, and the people have become craniacs. <laughs> wow, wow. They want to have these beautiful birds around. It enriches their environment. Mm -hmm. So... Um, we're, we're most encouraged, and a lot of our workers overseas are nationals that we've found, gifted people like you find here in Ohio mm -hmm. that are a gung-ho to make the world a better place. And if we can in some way empower them yeah. to express their potential, we found that this type of conservation leadership enriching is the most important part of our work. Fantastic, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, because you're, you're absolutely right, there's a lot of concerns in other parts of the world, whether it's poverty or employment or, uh, gosh, maybe governments that aren't really up to snuff. Uh, it really is getting the people involved and, like you say, becoming 
uh, craniacs or, right. or whatever their, their passion is, and, and, getting, and employing people in the area. It's a, it's a very complicated picture. Your society, society here in Cleveland is very complicated. Mm -hmm. My driver last night was explaining to me how when it floods, the sewerage gets dumped into the lake. That's right. And how do you redo the system here to, to make it foolproof? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. And all of the problems we're working on all over the world are very, very complicated. But the one thing that helps make it simple is a focus, and that focus is on these beautiful birds. Fantastic. And what they need, and everything sort of falls in behind it if you can keep a focus. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Now, at ICF, do you have volunteers? Uh, yes, working? we do. Mm -hmm. do you we have, have a lot people? of volunteers. Do you have young people, uh, teens, uh, <coughs> families? We have 18 uh, interns every year. Oh, wow. Paid? Paid. Wow. And they come for three, six, or nine months and we have housing for them in the stipend. And they work in one of three departments in habitat problems, like prairie restoration, wetland restoration, study of wild cranes. Second is captive breeding and releasing of whooping cranes into the wild. It's a very hands-on thing. And the third is in education. Mm -hmm. We have about 22,000 visitors a year, and we have three or four interns that work with that population. And we have a lot of school programs and so on. And now we're into social media and communicating with a much wider audience uh, in that manner. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, and so do you think education is really one of the major ways that any of us, whether it's the museum, your foundation, Western Cuyahoga Audubon, can get that word out? Yeah. And, and social media might be the one of the factors. Social media has an increasing role. It's a tool we never had before. Right. Uh, however, it has limitations to actually experiencing real nature alive and well. I can't really be replaced. I agree. So yeah. the more you can get people out or get their hands in the dirt or mm -hmm. get them to see a beautiful bird like a scarlet tanager can be a life changing sure. experience Absolutely. to see them in yeah. the wild. Yeah. It's how to touch people, I guess, in a meaningful manner. Not just touch, but touch, hook, and keep them involved. And right. hopefully, not just when they're young, but as they go through life and then either become a volunteer or work with some organization. You have to realize too that everybody's not going to be as interested as you are. Well, I'm going to try. <laughs> there are, you know, you'll talk to a lot of people, but you'll find in a big group of people, two or three, mm -hmm. that really have an interest. Okay. And those are the people that we found it's very profitable to encourage. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, just kind of wrapping things up, how are the whooping cranes doing now? <clears throat> the whooping cranes were reduced to just 15 individuals in 1940. They breed in far north of Canada, up in the Northwest Territories, and they winter on the coast of Texas. And bird by bird, through massive widespread public education and protection, and habitat protection, they've increased to about 300. Mm -hmm. In addition, we have 160 in captivity at a number of breeding centers. Mm -hmm. And from the captive birds, we have two experimental flocks, one here in the Midwest, flying from Wisconsin to Florida, sometimes mm -hmm. coming to Ohio. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And another one in Louisiana, a non-migratory flock. Okay. So in the experimental flocks, we have about 140 birds, 100 in the migratory group and 40 in the resident group. Wow, fantastic. So, do, you, do you have a favorite crane? I have <laughs> a favorite crane, and the one is that it's the crane that I'm looking at at the moment. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Because, you know, it's so hard to, to pick a favorite of anything. You're it absolutely is. right. My favorite yeah. person is one I'm talking to. Oh. 
Wow, that's that's <laughs> that's nice. Well, you know, it's been a, a real pleasure uh, talking with you and learning much more about your organization. We're glad that you're here at the museum to be able to talk with a full audience, and we're really pleased that you were able to do this uh, little mm -hmm. talk uh, for our Western Cuyahoga Audubon Group. I wish you every success. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.